Innovating Education Learning World in association with WISE, an initiative of Qatar Foundation. There is no agreement on whether studying the way the brain works can help improve educational outcomes. But it is certainly a fascinating area. Let's find out more about neurosciences and hear what the experts have to say. How do people get to learn a new language, read or even solve problems? When it comes to languages, why can't foreign speakers pronounce sounds as easily as native speakers? We went to the US and asked some neurological researchers to explain. The Teachers College of Columbia University in New York, founded in 1887, has a tradition of innovation in education. Today, they are studying the electrical activity of the brain to try and understand how people learn new languages, read and solve problems. Bab. 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 It's a little bit hard for me to say them even, but it's bub and bub. And those are sounds that matter in, um, the vowel sounds matter in American English. So just how quickly do we recognize sounds? In fact, it's not really a problem producing the sounds. Um, it's a problem perceiving the sounds. At the level of the brain, we can see that. Can anybody guess what kind of task might have been occurring here, just based on where the activations are? Up at the top here is the front of the brain. Yeah, yeah. You can tell something about what the brain is doing just by looking at where the activations are. So you can actually predict like, what letter somebody is looking at by looking at where the brain activation is. It's remarkable, really. Teachers from all kinds of institutions find these studies useful. A lot of what we do is close. Definitely not. I can understand sort of from an outsider's point of view, what was going on with the kids. I could see their behaviors and how they were interacting, but it was really hard for me to understand what was going on in their brains that autistic children are experiencing. Just understanding that sometimes need more oxygen to their brain. You know, I'd be able to help them with deep breathing and that could regulate their system a little. By studying the brain, I think I will be able to learn where in the brain is causing certain problems my patients are having. And I kind of see it as working with muscles. If you hurt your leg muscle, you wouldn't train your arm muscles to work better. So if I know which muscle or which part of the brain is causing the problem, I can target the skill better. For now, rather than showing how to treat disorders, neural research shows that any learning activity physically alters the brain. If we can turn the chair around so that you're facing. For students at Teachers College to be able to think about that, they do find it really kind of invigorating and exciting to know that they're having that kind of impact. We all find it difficult to sit still and concentrate sometimes, but people with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, always find it a challenge. Neuroscientists are trying to help. We find out how in this report from Canada. Rosaline and Gabriel both have Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. For children like them, listening to a teacher, staying focused on an exercise, or even just sitting still on a chair can all be major challenges. I'd say it's more difficult to concentrate and listen to the whole lesson when I want to move about the whole time. All the time I want to move about and run about outside. At home, Gabriel and his sister require constant attention from their parents. To help Gabriel do his homework properly, they have set up a routine. And we've established a timetable. So we look at what he has to do over the coming weeks, the coming months, and we divide it up week by week. 
and we identify long and short-term tasks and make sure he does a bit of both every evening. But can neuropsychology give teachers techniques to boost attention in the classroom? We use a stress ball, for example, and this allows students to contract the hand muscles, which helps them pay attention. We also use large elastic straps that attach to the legs of the chair in front so that the child can push against the elastic with their feet, and that stimulates attention too. An estimated 5% of children have ADHD, although the jury is still out on treatment options. Ritalin and other types of medication can be good tools for certain problems. It all depends on getting a good diagnosis. With a correct and thorough diagnosis of our neurologically caused attention deficit condition, the best tool is in fact medication. But there are other treatments too. For example, Cerebro Gym is an educational game aimed at boosting concentration and overcoming impulsive tendencies. These are exercises developed by speech specialists and neuropsychologists in hospitals to develop cerebral function. So having watched our reports, what do you think? Is there a strong link between neurosciences and education or not? Do let us know via our social media pages. But before you log on, let's hear the differing opinions of two experts. Perhaps they will help you decide. What are the links between neuroscience and education? For experts like American neurologist Judy Willis, they are self-evident. But for others, like Dorothy Bishop, a professor of developmental neuropsychology, it's too early to make the link. Um, there is a big movement trying to integrate neuroscience and education. Um, but I, I'm dubious as to whether there are any real applications as yet. I think it's too early days to really start implementing neuroscience in the classroom. We're finding out a lot from neuroscience about children and brains and how children's brains develop. But it's hard, I, I find it hard to see how you would take that straight to uh, educational practice. Neuroscience is going to save, is already saving billions of dollars with regarding education. There have been so many neuro myths. Until we have the neuroscience to investigate, people were spending money on thing exercises so they could exercise their right brain, exercise their left brain. With neuroimaging, that is such, un, such an untruth that neuroscience is saving education money. It's providing a right now picture of what's happening in the brain. We could use that to test any theory or intervention. We would do better to look at cognitive psychology, which could change, for example, you know, if you think about learning to read. We know from cognitive neuropsychology uh, studies of the reading process that although many people think of reading as a visual process, it involves a lot of analysis of sounds in language, and that has led to the development of educational methods for teaching children to read that involve a focus on the sounds in words um, rather than worrying about whether they get their letters the wrong way around. When teachers find out that genius is not in the genes, that everyone's background doesn't mean it has to be that way in the future, they have renewed energy and effort toward the student to getting that more responsive teacher. They respond with more effort. It's going to, it, it is game changing. The letters I get from teachers tell me how much more successful and how much happier they are in the classroom when they know how the brain works. But the Bridge Too Far was actually the title of a paper that was written about 20 years ago by a man called John Brewer in the States, who, who's a very eminent uh, person in this field, who, who made exactly that point and said he felt we were trying to go straight from neuroscience to education, and what we needed in the middle was cognitive psychology. And I think he said it 20 years ago, but it needs saying again. When there's communication among the people involved, that's when we'll have the most efficient and best research evaluation
tools and think about this one. Teachers who already know what works can tell the scientists, hey, why don't you test this? Because I sure know that it works. That will be an enduring bridge and there'll be three branches to that bridge. The cognitive psych neuropsychology, cognitive psychology, neuroscience, and the educators. That's it for now. I hope you've enjoyed the program. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye. Learning World, in association with WISE, an initiative of Qatar Foundation.